Good morning, everyone. We are just waiting on uh, a minor technical issue to be worked out so our online participants can join us. So just a few more minutes and we'll go ahead and get started.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you coming in this early in the morning um, for, our, for our session. Um, as we get started, uh, for those that are listening online, uh, uh, we are working out any remaining issues. However, we don't want to lose any of the uh, time that we have allotted, so we will begin. Um, that being said, we do have one online presenter today, and when we do uh, get to her, uh, I would ask that the earpieces that you have in front of you, uh, you can go ahead and put those on so that uh, you will be able to hear her presentation. And uh, we will uh, uh, start with her uh, as soon as we are confirmed that our technical I issues are resolved. Um, that being said, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Frank Pace. I'm with the University of Groningen and work with the Security, Technology, and E-Privacy Research Group. Um, uh, my particular, my focus uh, with the university is management of EU-funded law enforcement and security projects. I have a background in law enforcement from, from the, the United States. And joining me today um, uh, online is Mrs. Mariangela Biosciotti uh, from the Institute of Legal Information Theory and Techniques at the Italian National Research Council. Uh, immediately to my right is Mr. Jan, uh, 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 Jan, Ele 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 yeah. from uh, Europol Data Protection Office. And um, next to uh, him is Mr. Christopher Kelly from the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and uh, Marcus Hartman, Senior Prosecutor at the Office of Cologne. And uh, we have Mr. Ken Pennington, Superintendent with the PSNI. And to his right is Mr. Patrick Curry with the BBFA. Uh, joining us as well. Um, so to kick off our meeting, uh, if you have read the uh, introduction to our session, we are focusing on what uh, I think you've probably seen as a common theme here at the IGF and also on the forefront of a lot of issues related to, it, to internet governance, and that is the uh, cross-border access uh, uh, to information by law enforcement and criminal investigations. Uh, and counterterrorism investigations as well. Um, there are many issues right now that are on the forefront, including current pending um, court cases in the United States, legislation both uh, here in Europe and the U.S. as well. And with that, my, our desire, our goal today, is to have each one of these panelists who are, int who are intimately involved in each one of their respective uh, fields to uh, elaborate on the realities of how this is affecting uh, the law enforcement operations both here and in Europe. Um, we will begin with the presentation uh, from Jan, and that is going to be on the, per the perspectives of the uh, Europol's data protection uh, functions, and uh, we'll leave, leave this with Jan. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Frank, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I could put the slides on, mm, indeed. Uh, so when, when preparing the presentation for this uh, panel here, um, I thought about ways on, on how to go about this. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, what you see in the background now are fairly recent uh, headlines, basically. Uh, could you start the presentation if you go to yeah. so raining uh, what you see raining down now are uh, fairly recent headlines and what is common here in that theme is basically that all of them could be a topic for this panel I just let them rain down while introducing myself so as already mentioned my name is Jan Ellermann I'm working for Europol's data protection function for now a little more than uh, 10 years and before that time, I served as a public prosecutor in Germany, which I think is also a valuable experience for the job I'm doing right now. If you switch to the next slide. So the common theme, basically, for all the things we will discuss here on this panel, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's always about um, uh, security and freedom and uh, what you see here on the slide right now is a quote from um, Bruce Schneier basically who many refer to as the godfather or rock star of security and back in 2008 he made this quote so he said security versus privacy it's the battle of the century or at least its first decade so there are many legends surrounding this gentleman 
Um, one of them, if you go to the next slide, is this one here. But that is not what I wanted to talk about. So basically what I wanted to talk about is whether, to the next slide, please, uh, whether it is a good idea to talk about security versus privacy and whether it's not possible to do a little bit uh, better than that. Uh, so basically, I'm personally convinced that um, if we do it right, if we want to get it right, we need to increase both freedom and security. So um, we need to move away from the tune uh, freedom versus security, and that is what privacy by design and data protection by design is all about. So um, I found this looks very cool. So me and the famous Bruce Schneier on, on one and the same slide with two quotes and me even correcting him. So the truth is, of course, if you go to the next slide, there are a lot of very smart people uh, who agree uh, with that assessment, basically, that it's not freedom versus security, but it's both, and that includes Bruce in, in later publications. Um, I would like to issue a small warning here because I think if we want to have a reasonable debate about this topic, basically, we need transparency. You request transparency on many occasions, and I have a number of slides with me which shall illustrate, basically, what we are exposed to in the law enforcement world. And there are some very explicit one, uh, ones included. So referring to the EU Internet Referral Unit, I've joined uh, or I've listened to a panel where uh, referrals were discussed yesterday. So basically, um, referrals are about monitoring online content, Islamist, extremist, terrorism, propaganda in the case of, of Europol, the EU Internet Referral Unit. And when this was introduced, basically, there was a huge debate on whether or not that constitutes uh, the beginning of an Internet censorship unit uh, within the European Police Office. Uh, if you look at the next slide, basically, this is what we are really looking at. So this has nothing to do with uh, freedom of expression, but this is what our colleagues are exposed to, and this is what we are trying to prevent. Next to things such as this, so what we call Hollywood-style uh, propaganda. So this is basically propaganda which is tailored to lure vulnerable people, in particular young people, into the hands of the Islamic State. We look for this kind of propaganda and we inform the internet uh, uh, content providers basically about its existing, existence, recommending deletion. So what the next slide is about is to show that we don't have enforcement powers here. So it's not like we would decide as law enforcement that needs to go offline, but basically we inform the Twitters, the YouTubes, and the Facebooks that to our opinion, what we see in this particular context is non-compliant with their own rules and regulations. Um, as you can see here, you could do this this afternoon uh, or right away on your smartphone. So my message here for you is, every average internet user could be doing the same. So the lady you see here on the slide, that's my grandma, it's really her. So she's 97 years old. I've told her how Twitter and things work, so now she's online 24 seven to fight the Islamic State. This is of course classified information, has to stay here for her protection. Uh, but there, there are other angles to that. So the next one is basically that is a screenshot uh, relating to an investigation into sexual exploitation of children. And I give you just a few seconds to uh, read through that because that is what is probably most efficient here. So if you're reading that, basically what you see is these are atrocities. That's not just about physical abuse, that's about psychological abuse. And my message here for you is we need the tools to effectively prevent and combat these uh, things which happen online, and that's uh, reality. So when I read that, I, I found it uh, really shocking. On the other hand, I'm of course also aware as a member of the data protection community that many of you argue whenever it gets complicated, law enforcement plays the terrorism card and afterwards you, you play the uh, sexual exploitation of children card. And um, well, I, I do that here because that is the reality we are confronted with, but it's not limited to that. So if you look, look to the next slide, basically, this is a screenshot from the darknet. Here somebody can order, you could order easily um, a handgun with a silencer. So I can ask you what are the necessary business cases for a private person to order a handgun with a silencer? There are none. And there are hundreds out there, thousands out there which you can buy with a mouse click. 
Uh, to conclude my presentation here, I want to convey the message to you that we take privacy and data protection very seriously. So what you see here is a quote from the executive director of Europol, clearly acknowledging the uh, necessity to have uh, a robust data protection regime. At the same time, I think we need a public debate together with you on how we can get it right. And with these words, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, moving on um, to Chris. Um, I would like for Chris to elaborate a little bit on his uh, background, your current uh, efforts and challenges, and those that you've worked on in the past. And the floor is yours. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, and welcome. Uh, uh, to everybody this morning. My name is Chris Kelly. I run a cyber forensic lab uh, for the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. It's probably one of the larger uh, uh, such labs in the, uh, certainly in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but probably across the country uh, in the U.S. But I've also been a prosecutor for the past 15 years, focused almost exclusively on cyber cases. So what I'm going to do is talk about some of the emerging issues, uh, legal and, and uh, policy issues that we see in the U.S. and how they're shaping uh, what we do every day in law enforcement in terms of our forensic investigations, our uh, cyber investigations, as well as any other non-traditional or traditional types of criminal uh, cases that we uh, use digital evidence in for the purposes of detection, investigation, or prosecution. Um, we have some rather significant challenges like, like everybody else uh, in the U.S., but uh, with the number of, of major providers that we have there, uh, they're, they're, they're you know, increasingly complex, and uh, there's two major cases that are before our Supreme Court in the United States that could have a profound effect not only on law enforcement uh, and public safety in the U.S., but also uh, globally with the, with the way that they play out. So the first is one that's probably less well-known on the international uh, scale, and this is Carpenter versus the United States. This was a case that was heard before the Supreme Court just in the last, uh, the last month or so. It's a case that deals with law enforcement surveillance of a suspect in a bank robbery case. Uh, there was a, a, a court order that was issued for cell site location information uh, to a provider, to a cellular provider. Over the course of uh, three or four months, uh, they determined exactly all the different movements uh, for this particular suspect, ultimately tied him to a, a series of bank robberies uh, that he was tried and convicted in and ultimately sentenced. Uh, and uh, the case was heard before the Supreme Court, um, and the challenge in this case is whether the uh, U.S.-based law enforcement should be using search warrants for the purposes of tracking a person for that period of time, uh, if, you know, based on the constitutional needs, uh, in dealing specifically with the Stored Communications Act. So the Stored Communications Act is a federal statute uh, that all state, local, and federal law enforcement must adhere to for the purposes of uh, demanding that third-party providers, so cellular providers, internet service providers, social network providers, email providers, et cetera, provide information to law enforcement in the course of investigations. So we deal now with these different, uh, the different security interests and privacy interests and balancing those with public safety interests, and it's a very difficult conversation sometimes uh, to have, and it happens in boardrooms, it happens uh, in courtrooms, and it certainly happens before all of our different legislative bodies now. Uh, the Carpenter case uh, is, we don't have a, a resolution in the Carpenter case, uh, but indications from the court um, were rather significant that uh, questions to the government about how much surveillance is, uh, is, is too much, how much is, you know, uh, you know, what type of order should be necessary for, to, uh, for law enforcement to enhance what they could do visually uh, by tracking somebody using the technology. So, uh, we don't necessarily have an analog to what we're dealing with when it comes to this digital realm that we're in. And uh, courts now are wrestling with some of these issues and, and having a difficult time. It'll be interesting to see how this case comes out because of the third party uh, doctrine issues that we'll see in the wake of that. The second case is perhaps far more significant and certainly uh, salient to the conversation that we're here to have today. And this is the, uh, what has become known as the uh, Microsoft Dublin matter, or the Microsoft Dublin case. Uh, and it deals with uh, U.S.-based access to data that's stored on or that's stored on a foreign, uh, on foreign soil in, in Ireland. So the way this case came to, to, uh, to, uh, to be is that federal law enforcement applied for a search warrant for data uh, held by Microsoft. Um, they were granted that search warrant. And uh, when they went to execute that search warrant, they received certain information uh, back from Microsoft, but then uh, the response from Microsoft was that other data was stored overseas. 
uh, and that they, and this was content data and they couldn't provide that data to law enforcement. There was a series of challenges that went all the way up uh, and now the case is, is before our Supreme Court. And the question now before the court that they have to deal with is this. Does the federal U.S. Stored Communications Act allow for extra, essentially uh, the claim of extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction or extraterritorial application of our search warrant, uh, our search warrant capability? Uh, and this is a uh, question that deals with not only uh, the legislative history of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act going back to 1986, but also constitutional, additional constitutional dimensions and challenges that we'll see um, play out. So far, I think a total of 36 states in the United States have come out uh, in support of the Department of Justice's position uh, when it comes to this petition. And uh, several district courts, federal district courts, have also come out and ruled in the opposite manner from the Second Circuit uh, and therefore made it right for the Supreme Court to have heard this, this case. The case is going to be, uh, it, you know, it, 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 there, there are a number of legislative and, and uh, policy considerations that surround, but the case is refined to this very, very small um, issue of whether the Stored Communications Act does or does not allow for um, this type of application of the, uh, the search warrant. Um, it, obviously, this has an impact on uh, international, um, you know, cross-border data sharing, and it'll be very significant to see how this, this case turns out. You want me to keep going on? Does anybody else want to come? No, I can come back to it. I don't, I don't want to keep going. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, moving on, I'm going to go to Ken from the, P, from the PSNI, and the perspective that uh, we want to have Ken relate to the audience is that of the challenges and the realities of what is occurring on the ground uh, uh, in law enforcement at the investigative level. And with Ken, I'll let you expand further. Uh, thank you. Um, I have approximately 30 years in policing, uh, spanning a period of conflict. And whilst this may appear somewhat of a diversion, uh, I mention it by way of reassurance. If there's one thing I have learned, it is that the application of the law is a mechanism and not a rationale. Why are we doing these things? And fundamentally, whenever we came to deal in the field of counterterrorism, we needed to establish legitimacy, or can I say it in a simpler term, trust with communities, that we would use whatever powers we were given in an appropriate manner. And what I found is in, in any form of investigation, it's not security versus privacy. It's rights versus rights. We will have the rights of a suspect, and they are a suspect. I don't determine their guilt. So I'm going to have to consider what rights I'm going to engage. But I also have a positive obligation to protect the rights of others, the potential victims, the people that you saw in Jan's examples. I have an obligation in law to act. So I have to balance those two factors. When I come to balance those things, I have a number of tests. I have to be proportionate. So the level of intrusion I will be looking for will be the minimum that I require in order to achieve my reassurance that I am meeting the positive obligation to protect the rights of the others. And it will be a sliding scale determined by the level and severity of the offence that I am considering. I also need to have a legal power. I can't act without a legal authority. Uh, I act on behalf of the state, and hence the importance of getting powers in place to allow me to act. I also need to be accountable. Whatever decision I'm going to take, I need to provide an audit trail, I need to be responsible for it, and be prepared to stand in a court of law and defend it, because my proportionality test could be subjective. It needs to be tested. My interpretation of the law may or may not be correct because that changes over time. And my final test for normal policing is necessity. Do I need to do this? So when we look at these powers, those are the tests I will apply. What I would add to that in this realm of cyber is timeliness. Some of the uh, processes we have uh, you know, uh, letters of request, the mutual legal assistance treaties and so forth can take up to six months. In that period of time, 
we are still seeing people's rights engaged, the right to life possibly being put to risk, at risk, the right to private life, security and liberty all being put at risk whilst we are going through that due process. And indeed, that time frame will be prioritised by the host country, not us. Uh, it may be postponed by the host country if they have a parallel investigation ongoing. What I'm hearing from the ground is some of the problems around cloud storage access and indeed the legislation that we may have nationally may not be fit for purpose and we're having to interpret it, uh, current legislation to just get some action. We also have the problems of hackers using stolen servers from another jurisdiction. Uh, a very big challenge for us in trying to gather uh, information which may, might assist us. Cryptocurrency, um, the ability to connect a virtual wallet with a real person, um, that has to be done so quickly that we can really only do it currently in the most serious of cases, uh, which means criminals are basically getting away with criminality. The dark net and encryption uh, presents us with difficulties. Uh, we have ways of getting around um, those difficulties, none of which I can really discuss here, but none of them are quick, none of them um, are easy, and none of them uh, come without a financial cost. Um, ISPs, when we're working with them, uh, what I would say is generally uh, helpful, however less so around large-scale hacking and uh, ransomware uh, and that's an area we might see on the increase. I suppose as a law enforcement officer, uh, whatever we develop, um, I would like to see it being future-proofed, if at all possible that is. But the reason I ask for that is that what I see is that legislation tends to be national and tends to be slow to develop. But these technical problems and technology tends to be international and quick to develop. So there are going to have to be new mechanisms to address this problem. Thank you, Ken. Um, certainly a lot to digest, and, and I, we, we do welcome your questions at the conclusion of our presentations, and we will try and make up for some uh, lost time. With that being said, I will move right on to Marcus Hartman, and I know Marcus's presentation is ready, so the floor is yours, sir. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I would like to give you a quick over overview about uh, practical cybercrime cases and the implications that the given legal situations have. Just to start with, a few quick words about uh, my team. I'm a senior prosecutor with the Cologne Prosecutor's Office. Uh, this office is responsible not only for the Cologne District, but for the whole of the state of Northern Westphalia. Those of you not familiar with the topography of uh, Germany, Northern Westphalia is one of the 16 states and the biggest. It has about 18 million population and uh, about one third of uh, Germany's top 100 companies are located in my district. So we have quite a few high profile cybercrime cases that my department is in charge of. One of these cases I would like to pick just as one example is the NotPetya ransomware that I think all of you have heard about recently. What has happened is that a ransomware, a piece of malware that is encrypting all user data and thus preventing the use of the computer and asking for a ransom has spread through some clever compromise of an update infrastructure of an Ukrainian-based company that uh, delivers with uh, a special software for filing taxes and dealing in general with uh, the Ukrainian authorities. So what happened is that this software did not only cause a lot of damage in uh, the Ukraine themselves, but in the whole of Europe and abroad, because every company that has business relationships with uh, the Ukraine has to use this software and thus got infected through the compromised update. So basically, uh, this is just one example of how such a simple thing as ransomware can make an investigation from the very start a huge international case. And I would like to stress that every of these cases, every high profile cybercrime case is an international case. There's no such thing as local or even um, country-based criminal investigations in the field of cybercrime. And we have to take that in mind and have to keep that in mind and take that for our considerations as to how the legal framework for addressing these cases has to change. 
I would like to present you with a few ideas of uh, what could be the keys to success in order to fix the present situation. First, I would like to mention that what you started already is speed. If we don't get access to data relevant to the investigations in time, we don't get access to the data at all because data that is delivered to us with a delay will, need, uh, will lead us uh, into uh, non-existent uh, discovery of further investigations. That means if we don't get the data in time, we cannot seize uh, the, the, the servers, cannot arrest the data abroad, and uh, in fact, all the investigation might stop if data access is not presented in a timely manner. Whether this could change through an improvement in uh, international legislation, maybe allowing direct access from one country to another, or whether we would uh, fix this uh, matter by investing more resources, people and uh, technical resources into the uh, given sy um, system of mutual legal assistance. It's not relevant to the fixing the practical issues, but we need to recognize that we have to do something about that because speed is the main limiting factor at the moment. Second, we need to deal with efficiency of investigations. At the very moment, we have lots of discussions ongoing with all types of organizations, with companies, and everybody is developing his own system for law enforcement access. May it be an online platform, may it be we are traditional means of phone calls, faxes, and whatever. We need to find some sort of standards that uh, allow for quick and efficient cooperation. We need uh, to establish some sort of level of trust in the international community so that every prosecutor can see already uh, by evaluating the formal grounds of a request whether this uh, request comes from a party uh, that is a, a respectable party and should be followed or not. For example, we have no agreed standard of uh, uh, shared and encrypted and authorized um, communications among law enforcement uh, on a global perspective. Somebody is using PGP, the next are using SMIME, and this uh, is another technical issue which has to be dealt with on the, on the grounds of efficiency. And the third one, I would like to think about the prosecution on an international scale as something like an international team. I would uh, like to see at some time in the future distributed prosecu prosecution clusters. Let me come back to the example I presented in the beginning of my talk. Um, the Petya case, uh, well, not Petya ransomware. Um, law enforcement is organized in Germany on a state, not on a federal level. That means we have 16 states in Germany alone investigating this not Petya case. If you see it in a broader perspective, we have all the states in Europe affected. We have global infections. Do we really have the need that every state is investigating this case on its own? Everybody is uh, analyzing the Melva on its own. Everybody is uh, following the data and the financial trades. So I think we have to find new ways of cooperation and we have to find legal grounds in order to organize such a form of distributed prosecution among a global law enforcement community. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, very, very valid points, and I think to focus on the immediacy of need of access for law enforcement data is one of the key ones, as well as the efficiency. And these are all topics that we're seeing that are discussed and, me and mentioned uh, by companies like Microsoft and Mr. Brad Smith and Mr. Kent Walker from Google and, and uh, even recent comments from former Attorney General Eric Holder uh, from the, the United States um, all essentially point to a lot of the issues that do have to pertain to the MLAT procedures and, and the uh, access of information in a, in, a, in a timely fashion. With that being said, uh, we are going to move on to our last um, panelist and uh, Mary Angela will be online, so if you would please, if you put your earpieces on, you'll be able to listen to her, and we will go ahead and uh, let her begin as soon as we are connected. Okay. 
Mario Angela, if you would please, you can go ahead and share your screen with your presentation and uh, we can begin. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we, we can hear you.
Thank you very much, Maria Angela. Thank you. Um, before we get into uh, questions, uh, before we conclude the uh, session, I think the presentation that you just observed uh, is a good example of the efforts that have been un underway both in, in the EU and abroad over the last several years to uh, address both the technical policy and societal questions and challenges that are uh, a very much a part of this uh, topic. With that being said, I'll take the remainder of the time to uh, open up the floor to any questions any one of our panelists. Yes, sir. My name is Amjad Manzoor. I'm uh, representing the uh, State Bank of Pakistan. I just wanted to ask the panel what is being done at the level of the UN because uh, maybe EU has uh, a wider ownership of the, uh, the countries, but lots of uh, you know these threats are generated from outside EU and other countries. So, is there any effort of sharing of especially the speed and um, the efficiency you you said because uh, uh, we also find this phishing emails also coming in and uh, they are using this yahoo email accounts or and they don't share the data of the sender so that's the is, is there anything being done on the un level i'll let patrick address that so my name is patrick Curry. bit better if i press the button um uh, my name is Patrick Curry. I'm from an organization called BBFA, which is a not-for-profit, uh, which was created after the collapse of the UK National Identity Scheme. Uh, my background is military, aerospace, high assurance, uh, cybersecurity, uh, counter-fraud, and identity management, particularly identity management. And to come to this point, um, the short answer is a joined-up approach at the UN level. I'm not aware of anything at all. And my suggestion is a very simple one. Criminals collaborate. They don't, they don't feel hampered by borders. And if we're going to deal with these kinds of challenges and make places safer to do business uh, in all its senses, uh, then we, uh, we need to collaborate more effectively. And what we're saying is industry having to do that so if I look at the banking sector, in Europe they are currently looking at 18 new pieces of legislation because this is how governments respond. They produce legislation, but they don't actually put in place the behaviors for collaboration to occur. Um, and in that legislation, the top legislation that's driving progress is the anti-money laundering directive, which now includes virtual currencies, the payment service directive two, which includes the requirement for secure customer authentication at a very detailed level, which impacts way beyond the financial sector into all retail, and general data protection regulation, uh, so privacy. So why do I mention this, to get back to your point? Um, I, I, I'm just going to illustrate this. In the EU and in many other parts of the world, Nations have cybersecurity strategies, and the EU cybersecurity strategy, one of the big problems was the top enabler for crime was identity fraud. And so within Europe, we've seen a rise in identity management related uh, legislation and ID initiatives, and we talked about the Estonian e-residency and so on. So the requirements for identity to give accountability and traceability in supply chains, in border control, in national security, in regulatory compliance. The need is there in the prevention space. So within the EU and working with other allies and partners in the US and Asia, there has been a lot of effort looking at how we do collaborative risk management. And as part of that, some excellent work's been done. But here's the issue. There are standards in place for risk management, risk treatment, risk mitigation, risk assessment. We're beginning to see collaboration for cyber information sharing, threat intelligence, vulnerabilities, incident management. There are over 220 com computer emergency response teams in Europe that have been formed within the last five years. But we don't have those collaborative behaviors in the investigation side. There are no standards for meaningful international standards for the preservation of evidence within systems, particularly when they're under attack. 
And so without effective prosecution, we don't have effective deterrence of criminals. So we keep coming into a cycle of prevention, detection, and response. And that's what happens at a government and industry level. But there's no dialogue running with law enforcement. So law enforcement is just left to do the prosecution and investigation piece without much help from government or from industry. So what needs to happen, in my view, is A, law enforcement needs to be much more involved in the development of collaborative standards. It is completely absent from that debate. B, they need to establish collaborative trust mechanisms, which we have in NATO, we have in, in, from a systems point of view, between governments in industry, and I'm looking particularly at things like PKI Federation, high assurance or the EIDAS activity in Europe, or the e-residency activity, which again is cross-border. None of these identity standards are being leveraged in support of uh, prosecution, forensics, and investigation in a meaningful way today. And my personal view is I would like to see a lot more work being done in ICANN and other bodies, RIR, to help in, in, in putting together collaborative groups to start to resolve what you're talking about. But it can only happen if we ask for it. Thank so you, I Patrick. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Okay. My, if I understood you correctly, you thought it was bad, a bad thing that we, you could see all what the terrorists were doing, the terrorist groups, etc., etc. Why on earth would you want to change it? Why on earth would you want to take that off the web? Isn't it wonderful that these people are so stupid that they're showing us all their information, who they're friends with, where they're going, when they're going on a trip? Why would you want to change that? Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I agree with you as far as they, uh, these terrorists are stupid enough, let's say, to provide us with leads. What, we're, what, what I've shown you is basically the issue of uh, Islamist uh, terrorism propaganda. So that is out there in order to lure vulnerable people into their hands. So that these are recruitment measures, basically.
Ashcroft case, uh, the Department of Justice of the U.S. argues that U.S. warrants work to compel a provider to disclose data that it stores abroad in Ireland. Um, if the Department of Justice wins and then the shoe is put on the other foot, and for example, a Belgian court says that um, a provider in Massachusetts must disclose data under Belgian law about an American without ever meeting the U.S. probable cause standard, what would the uh, Department of Justice of Massachusetts say to that uh, um, attempt to compel a disclosure? The simple response is that there's no Department of Justice in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Greg. <laughs> it's, it, so I, I think this is, is one of those um, really difficult areas of this dynamic when it comes to the Stored Communications Act. There are many countries uh, that already do have this method of compulsion for data that's stored within their within their own sovereign nations, and that is one of the significant that is going on right now, and it has been for quite some time. The real key with the Stored Communications Act, with this particular uh, uh, case, and the uh, the way that the Supreme Court comes out is going to be whether they decide that the compelled production within the United States is something that's allowable. So this is it's U.S.-based investigation, U.S.-based court order or search warrant. Uh, it is a, a domestic provider, so it's within the, the United States. And production and access to the data is also done within the United States as well. And the question is, um, regardless of where that data lives, should that, should that company uh, uh, be compelled or can Congress, more appropriately, compel that company to provide that data within the United States? And I think that that's the confined, uh, you know, issue that's being dealt with here in the Stored Communications Act. But the, and the short answer to your question is that lots of different countries are, are treating this in a similar way, is that uh, we saw instances of it in Brazil as well, where uh, Brazilian authorities went to the offices, I believe it was Yahoo and Microsoft, or Yahoo and Facebook at some point in time, and arrested members of their staff that did not uh, produce records uh, that were there. These are obviously very difficult and, and complex questions that are going to be um, that are going to be you know answered in the wake of this many you know of the the folks that are at the table here all have come to the same conclusion that really the the proper form for this is is congress is to deal with these on a, a you know with these issues by having all the different parties stakeholders come together and i think that that communication uh, and collaboration on this, I, I tend to agree with that. Communication, collaboration, and people sitting down and making concessions and understanding that you know the, the more broad dynamic here is is really the critical factor. Would just like to add a quick note on that. You're absolutely right. When, as a government, you ask for direct access to data that is stored abroad, you need to be ready to provide data for everybody else accessing the data that is stored on your grounds. So that is why I mentioned um, that I'm not ready to give up on the traditional means of mutual legal assistance all too, too early, but that we need to realize that the given system is on a vast level understaffed and uh, under-equipped with resources. If you just count in different countries how many prosecutors or people within the ministries are responsible for dealing with international law enforcement requests then the bottleneck for processing these requests in a more quicker, in a quicker and in a more efficient way is just uh, not the, the general issue of that the, legal, the mutual legal assistance system is not working, but that it is not adequately staffed. Thank you. In the back. I realize the answer to my question depends on the jurisdiction, so I'd love to hear both an American and European response to this which is how do or should we draw the line between legitimate speech and terrorist propaganda? So, for example, if somebody is very angry about a certain group or a certain country or even has feelings about a certain religion and wants to express them, perhaps in very strong terminology, how do we draw the line between that and somebody who we think is likely to do harm uh, to that or other groups that we should have some kind of intervention? It, it seems to me especially in the U.S., to be very tricky. I know Europe has, has, has different kind of laws on this, but I'm wondering if you folks would comment. Okay. 
I, I can be brief on that, uh, hopefully. So formally, we apply the definition of uh, the terrorism directive uh, according to EU law, so we would make an assessment down those lines. In practical terms, we indeed had these discussions. For instance, when it comes to the Islamic State, I had the colleagues of the EU Internet Referral Unit approaching me with pictures where you just saw, you know, palm trees, a sunset, and then the black flag swinging and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that is something, it is IS propaganda, but basically my advice was let's not refer that stuff because there's so much out there which is clearly within the boundaries of the definition that at least for the time being we don't have to go to the borderline cases. Thank you. I'm curious, uh, one of the U.S. colleagues, because, you know, we, our First Amendment goes, for example, I know Germany has certain hate speech laws that would, would not be accepted in the U.S., and I'm curious from our perspective if anybody has any thoughts on that. U.S. perspective. I'm not familiar with the particular uh, German statute that you refer to, but well, for example, Nazi propaganda or even depictions of swastikas would be illegal in Germany, as I understand it. But in the U.S., right. it would be considered protected speech. For right. example. Yeah. So it, obviously, the First Amendment gives you that that you know freedom of speech and and protection um, for you know points of view, uh, things that you say. It's when those, but but none of our the 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 those rights that are protected. Um, are absolute in their their nature, right? So anytime that you uh, yell fire in a in a right. movie and you uh, put other people's uh, you know safety at risk, then you might be committing some type of an offense that um, that you know that your your words become actions uh, to a certain extent, and those become. So it, it would be it's it's very difficult without an example or or yeah. tangible to say whether something is or is not protected speech under the First Amendment. But it's all done on a case-by-case -case type of a analysis. Marcus? Just a quick comment from the German perspective. Um, it's a little bit of misunderstanding that uh, the hate speech laws, so to, so to say, in Germany are uh, on a vastly different from that in, uh, in the U.S. I think 80%, um, 85 maybe even 90% of the cases referred to my department that are considered from on, on the estimation of the providers to be hate speech are uh, when evaluated by a prosecutor not to be considered a criminal act but just some angry person announcing his, his personal opinion. So I think the cases that really ask for a, um, um, an answer by a prosecutor's body are uh, of, a, of a level and an intensity that can be agreed on that they should be criminal in Germany and in the States and other countries as well. Okay. So I think if you look at the practical cases, the difference margin between what counts as a criminal act is uh, not that different uh, from, from uh, my perspective. Okay. Quickly, Ken, you had a comment? In answer to the question, how do you balance, you know, um, uh, freedom of expression against, you know, uh, hate speech, uh, and we have legislation for that, I suppose the answer is carefully and proportionately. Um, what I would say is the criminal justice system may not be the best place to start. I have seen counter radicalization work in Malaga, uh, which will be a pilot for the rest of Spain, where that low level uh, type of stuff that we saw with the banners and so forth, the first point of contact is actually social services because the early reports are usually parents with maybe teenagers, and rather than criminalizing them at an early stage, they're trying to address what their views are, and only in the most extreme cases, passing that to law enforcement. Okay, we have time for one more comment, then we have to conclude. In the, in the scenario in Germany where the prosecutor determines that the speech is not unlawful, would it be appropriate for uh, another element of the government of Germany to flag that speech to uh, the provider as a violation of the provider's terms of service and then get the speech removed even though it is not unlawful. Well, this kind of work is done not by government bodies but by uh, non-government organizations. For example, the Providers Association of Germany takes complaints by people that uh, come up with uh, some postings online and refers them to the providers themselves. 
If you are referring to the discussion of the new Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, I don't know what the term is in, in English, the, the law that requests uh, providers of social media platforms to delete um, online postings um, when they are considered to be unlawful. I, as a prosecutor, in my personal view, think uh, that the right uh, point to judge whether something is lawful or unlawful is not the provider but the prosecutor. So we have started a project uh, with my department, with media partners from, from the press and with partners from social media networks in order to streamline the process of flagging content, reviewing it on legal grounds and deciding what has to be deleted or what has not to be deleted and providing the, the necessary help to, to the providers and establish a common agreement on that. I think there's still lots of work to be done and we'll see where this discussion leads us. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their time and contributions and for all of you for attending our sessions. Thank you and have a great day. Enjoyed your uh, presentation yesterday. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to have a philosopher. <laughs> we need more philosophers. <laughs> well, I consider myself an amateur philosopher. So. <laughs>